This video is going to be all about pug mills. What they are, how they work, what are the upsides and the downsides to them, and whether or not you should get one. I will timestamp everything so you can jump to the sections that you want to jump to, and if you're just here to find out whether or not you should get one, the answer is probably not, unless you really think you should, in which case definitely should. But I will explain all of that as we go. First off, what is a pug mill? A pug mill is a machine to prepare clay. Basically, it replaces wedging by hand. It processes and extrudes clay, and I don't know if there are other variations of it, but everything that I've seen uses a screw thread to do this, which I assume is where the mill part of it comes from. The pug is apparently a historic term for processing clay, coming from pugno, meaning to pound the clay, but not everyone agrees on this, but either way, a pug, it refers to the clay, so pug mill is a mill for milling clay. There are a variety of designs of pug mill. Fundamentally, as I say, all the ones that I've seen use a screw thread to drive the clay through the body. How they do that exactly can vary quite a lot, and then they can do additional processes as well, depending on how they're designed. So there are a range of options, a range of sizes and designs, and different ones might suit different people. I'm not a pug mill expert. I have had a pug mill for best part of a year now. I got it towards the end of last year. So I've used mine, I've taken it apart, put it back together, cleaned it, etc. So I've got some familiarity with one design of it and I've looked into the other designs. But if you know of ones that I don't cover here, then uh, please leave something in the comments to say as much. I'd like to learn more. There isn't that much on the internet about them. You know, I did my own research, but it would always be good to have some other voices on this. I called, and I don't know if there's a better term for this, the two types of pug mill design that I've seen, continuous and reversible. What I'm referring to there is whether or not the motor only turns in one direction or can turn in both. The most basic design would be a continuous pug mill with no de-airing capabilities, I'll get to that in a second, which essentially would be a screw thread that always turns in one direction, you put clay in one end of the body, it gets squashed by the screw thread, mixed and squashed, and comes out compressed through the far end, having essentially been kneaded and compressed, and hopefully when it comes out, it's in a nice usable state or at least slightly more worked and more usable. The reversible, the simple reversible mixer pug mill has the ability to turn in the opposite direction. So you can put clay in and mix it without extruding. It will turn around in the drum of the mixer. So they tend to have a much bigger body so that you can fill them up. Typically they seem to have a cap that can go over the far end so you can make essentially a sealed mixer a bit like a cement mixer and you feed in whatever you want in the top in the mixing setting and mix as much as you need to and then you stop it flick a switch put and it turns in the extrude setting at which point all the clay is worked towards the outlet and extruded out both of these will prepare the clay obviously the reversible one has the extra ability of mixing but would be slower if you were doing that because the clay is not extruding while you're mixing, where a continuous one will come out as fast as the machine will allow if you're feeding it in that fast. So you can get through a lot more clay on a continuous one, although obviously with a reversible one, you could be using it in a continuous setting. So you could have it just set to one direction and then it will just extrude out. Then you add the option to de-air. Now, the way de-airing works is there's a vacuum pump that sucks all the air out of a sealed part of the machine. And as the clay is mixed, any air bubbles that come anywhere near the surface will pop out and the air will be sucked out because of the vacuum pump. And the idea being that after a little bit of time in that condition, all of the air or pretty much all of the air should have left the clay. So by the time it comes out, it gets compressed and comes out the end of the mill, there should be no air bubbles. If you're throwing a piece, often an air bubble can mean um, scrapping the piece and starting again, at least on the wheel, because by the time you've noticed the air bubble, even if you manage to repair it, the piece will probably be lopsided as a result. You don't really want prepared clay with air bubbles in, and having the ability to 
suckle the air out the clay is worth paying more for but it makes the machine significantly more complicated so you'd have to pay for it a dear and continuous pug mill is i think a very clever design whereby the body of the pug mill is basically split in half with a dividing plate that has little holes in it and what happens is the clay goes into the first part of the the pug mill and the screw thread compresses the clay against the dividing plate as more clay is added the clay behind forces the clay in front through the dividing plate the holes extrude it into spaghetti basically so chances are any air bubbles will come to the surface at which point it's in a second chamber the second chamber is where the vacuum pump is attached once the outlet is full of clay you have an airtight stopper of clay against the dividing plate and the outlet at the same time meaning it's got basically a perfect seal and depending on the quality of the vacuum pump it can draw down a certain amount of vacuum so there's no air within that chamber and any air bubbles that come in in the clay will be quite easily pulled out of the clay they get sucked out through the vacuum pump and then obviously the clay works its way through the machine hopefully with no air in it obviously the advantage to this is by having two separate chambers there's no vacuum in the first chamber you that one's open the clay goes in and comes out continuously while still pulling a vacuum in the second part of the chamber so it continuously de-airs the design of a, a de-airing reversible mixer pug mill i looked at the peter puggers and as best i can tell they have a vacuum chamber behind the back wall of the uh, mixing chamber it draws the air out of the main chamber through uh, a gap around the axle of the mixer and to avoid that getting clogged up with clay they seem to have a another reversed screw thread so any clay that gets into that shaft is worked back into the the main clay but i'm not sure how well that works um, if anyone's got a peter pugger please feel free to chime in i've not heard anything bad about them so it must work fairly well but it does seem like it might be drawing a vacuum in that first chamber without being able to effectively apply it to the clay in the mixer because there's only one chamber in a reversible pug mill you have to put an airtight seal on the lid so you can only draw a vacuum while the lid's on and if you want to add any more clay you have to release the pressure take the lid off put the clay in and put it back but that's how it will create an airtight seal and that means you can create the vacuum while it's in its mixing setting you get to mix it for longer in a vacuum if you had particularly air filled clay you can just let it mix for longer whereas a continuous one it passes through in a set amount of time and if it's not fully de-aired when it comes out the first time you have to feed it back through again so they are different designs that achieve similar results there's a different working process to use them and i have to say i can't comment too much on the comparison between the two designs having only spent any real time using my one i have a Shimpo de-airing stainless steel pug mill which I paid about £6,000 for last year. Um, since then the price has gone up significantly and I'll get into the economics of it in a bit. They are a lot of money. They cost more than a decent wheel and kiln put together so they are a big expense. If you're running a studio with a lot of people with a lot of equipment you only need a single pug mill they can easily justify that cost if you're a small studio and it's just you working there it becomes harder to justify that cost but i will get on to that in a second first i'm just going to run through the reasons you might want a pug mill as i said at the beginning they basically replace wedging the upside is that it's so much physically less demanding Wedging is a job that can be quite difficult on the body, especially with stiff clay, especially if you're doing a lot of it. A lot of people have wrist pain and you know shoulder pain, whatever. There are a lot of ways that pottery is quite physical and this is one of the more physical elements that can, over a career, a lifetime in pottery, can add up to quite a physical toll on the body. And having a pug milk basically removes all of that you don't need to there's almost no physical effort to using a pug mill the next advantage is it's much easier wedging in a way 
that's effective and does not work air into the clay is a skill as anyone who's tried to learn it will attest it's not as straightforward as someone who knows what they're doing can make it seem it took me quite a while to get to the point where i could reliably not add a lot of air as i went so having something that takes the skill component completely out means that wedging is a task that a you wouldn't have to learn and b you can pass on to someone else so if you work in a shared studio or if you have an intern or if you have family or friends who come and help you on particularly busy periods of time like the run-up to Christmas say you can hand off the clay prep as a job in a way that you couldn't if you were talking about the skill of wedging clay manually you wouldn't hand that off to someone who had no idea what they were doing but this you can it's, it's no big deal it is a little bit faster it's not that much faster um, and it's not that hands off so you will still be spending the time feeding it in the clay, especially if you're running it through a couple of times to get it even more smooth. It's not something you just press go on and come back five minutes later. You have to be there paying attention, but it will be faster than wedging by hand. And obviously that small time saving, even if it's only half, two thirds the time, that adds up over a longer period, especially if you're dealing with a lot of clay. It becomes much easier to adjust the consistency of the clay as you can feed in a clay that's too firm and a clay that's too soft and the machine will just smush them together and you get one that's about right it becomes a much nicer consistency so if you're regularly buying clay that's either too firm or too soft and you want a way to incorporate clays at different dryness to even them out into one that you actually want to work with or to add a like splash of water and let that get mixed through it will make that much easier because it deals with it all inside the machine so you can do that and then a double advantage is that if you're considering a pug mill because of the physicality of wedging is causing you pain chances are throwing with too firm a clay will also cause you pain so being able to adjust that is quite a handy upside as well so it will reduce uh, the physical strain there as in addition to the wedging so again, you know, that's a, that could be a huge upside if that's why you were looking at this or not if you weren't. Because they deal with the wedging, they are great for reclaim. So you should be keeping all your clay scraps and your throwing water. The reason for that's quite simple because the finer particles end up in the water, meaning that over time the clay separates out. And if you're throwing away your water, your throwing water, then you're losing part of the clay the fine part which keeps it more plastic so your reclaim will be worse if you're not keeping your throwing water and then what you want to do is keep all your dry trimming scraps and your throwing water then recombine them and wedge them back up and you should have a perfectly good clay a lot of people put it off because it's a pain and a pug mill will make that easier particularly a mixer pug mill as you can put the dry scraps and the throwing water straight into the drum of the mixer and let the mixer deal with mixing it back up. If you've got a continuous pug mill like I have, you have to do that mixing part and getting it to the right consistency first, and then you feed it through the pug mill to prepare it. This is something that I didn't expect to be the case, but one huge upside to having a pug mill is you actually have less reclaim to do. There are a variety of processes that I do with my clay, so throwing when I separate it out into balls there might be a little bit left making handles there's all the wastage when I load the extruder and there's any off cuts at the end and so on and so forth there's lots of processes where I have perfectly usable plastic clay that I've literally essentially just taken out of the bag but it's now a little scrap and obviously you can't put that straight back into the bag because if you've got a collection of scraps they now have air pockets between them and if you just added that in without wedging them back up you're adding air so you don't want to do that so what i used to do is i'd shove them all in a bag and then when i when the bag was full i'd wedge the whole bag back up and i'd have plastic reclaim from reclaiming my plastic clay or i would if there were small scraps and i couldn't be bothered to get the bag out i'd throw them in the bucket of dry scraps where they'd dry out and then they'd go back into the reclaim that way but essentially all of the clay scraps that i was producing even though the clay was perfectly usable it had to be reclaimed one way or another 
with a pug mill you just shove them back in the pug mill so once i'm done loading the extruder i take all the plastic scraps feed them into the inlet and then obviously they'll be mixed back in and de-aired when i next run the pug mill so i actually get a lot less reclaim i mean i don't do a lot of trimming so that's part of it but i reckon i probably have less than half the amount of reclaim that i did now that i can immediately return my plastic clay scraps back into circulation so i'm buying clay less frequently i'm reclaiming less frequently and doing less work when i reclaim so big upside there but there are some downsides and for me there are some pretty big downsides first off it's the cost there's no getting around it they're probably the most expensive thing you're going to buy for a studio definitely the most expensive thing in my studio as i said more than my kiln and wheel put together and that is a hard thing to justify however you cut it and they don't come up second hand very often in my experience when i wrote the article which i'll link in the description i checked ebay and there were two in the entire uk listed on ebay they were about half the price that they would be used so around i think they were around one and a half to three thousand pounds and that was heavily used and without shipping so you'd have to go and collect them a similar sized pug mill would be two and a half to four thousand pounds new because these were not de-airing and i've never seen a de-airing pug mill come up for sale second hand not that i watch it religiously but i did check quite often in the period before buying mine they come up infrequently and i've never seen a de-airing one if you're looking at the new de-airing pug mills mine was one of the cheapest so that was six thousand pounds then and prices go up a lot from there you can spend easily twice that if you wanted to they are big and heavy mine doesn't take up that much room the footprint one and a half meters by half a meter and it fits under a bench which because it's on casters and my floor's flat but it is very heavy 150 kilos and it's awkward so picking it up even with two people is you know it's a bit of a challenge you're definitely not going to be picking it up on your own i mean if you think you can pick up 150 kilos of something awkward and carry it around yourself you know that you can do that and you're probably competing in strongman the the size is a problem if you need to move it around and your floor's not flat as far as functionality they really only have the one function and they're very good at it to be fair to them but most other bits of studio equipment are either versatile like a wheel will do a, a range of things or something like a kiln which really only has one function but it's an essential function a pug mill has one function and it's a function that could easily be replaced by hand you don't need it to do the thing and then the next problem is quite a big one it's how much of a task it is to clean the thing there's a lot of clay in there and they are big and heavy they need to be because of the amount of force that they create but it means that when you take them apart each part of the casing is significant they're big chunks of metal they don't fit in a sink they're covered in clay so dissembling it is a messy long-winded process cleaning it is a messy long-winded process you're unlikely to be able to get the whole machine outside which would make it a little bit easier on account of the size and the weight all in all it took me a couple of hours to take mine apart and clean it i think i'd be faster next time even if you know exactly what you're doing clay when it's stuck in a like there are a lot of nooks and crannies and clay is stuck everywhere cleaning them is not fun and it's you know fairly long-winded which wouldn't be a problem and isn't a problem i haven't cleaned mine since the one time i cleaned it if you're not changing clays which i'll get to in a second because i just wanted to point out as well that obviously the bigger a pug mill is the harder it's going to be to take apart and clean so the smaller ones will be easier the de-airing makes mine bigger so if you had a non-de-airing one every part of it will be smaller and lighter which would make it easier and i have been told that reversible pug mills you can just put the cap on the end and run them it, um, with water inside which will clean a lot of the clay out and make it a lot easier to clean before you take it apart cleaning them is an amount of effort but it needs to be done because they trap a lot of clay inside them in mine in particular obviously because it's a de-airing one there's two pockets where clay builds up intentionally to allow the de-airing part to become an airtight seal 
but I mine holds nine kilograms of clay, so basically a full bag of clay, more or less, worth of clay just shoved into the, those gaps. So that's how much clay is left once it can't extrude anymore. What that would mean is that if you wanted to take the machine apart and clean all the clay out to get ready for the next clay of a different color, you would be taking almost an entire bag's worth of clay out and you'd have to put a bag's worth of clay back in before any will cut start coming out of the machine. So it's not, not a straightforward task that doesn't require much clay. It's, it's, it's quite an undertaking to do it, but you have to take it apart and clean it because there are so many nooks and crannies for the clay to get stuck in. Even if you went, what a lot of people suggest is you go from light clay to dark clay. So if you had three clays, say, a white clay, a terracotta, and then a dark clay, you could pug all of your light clay and then run through your terracotta until it stopped. You stop getting the streaks of white, and then pug all your terracotta. And then once you're done with that, run the dark clay through until you get stop getting streaks of terracotta, and it's all mixed in. But when I took mine apart, you could clearly see the layers of the previous clays. Even though each time I had done that, I had run it through until the colour was uniform, and there was no evidence of the previous clay. That clay is trapped in there which means that at any point it could be dislodged and you will get a chunk of the wrong color clay in with the clay you're milling out. Now that might be not be a problem for you and if not that's fine. You know, it, it's just going to be a small streak of the wrong color and especially if you've gone from light to dark it's going to be a lighter contamination in a darker clay which will be less obvious. But if you want your clay to be exactly as it should be, you can't really have pockets of the wrong clay in the pug mill because you won't necessarily catch them in the clay until it's too late. Ideally you want to take the whole thing apart and clean it between clays which is where the fact that it's such a pain to clean and there's so much clay gets trapped in there you're not going to do that trivially. So I used to use two clays and I would just switch between them as needed. I stopped using the second clay for the pug mill. I had an idea that I was going to start mixing up my own. I still will start at some point mixing up my own clay, but it's not the highest priority for me. But one of my ideas was when I'm mixing up my own clay, I'll just do limited edition, like a block of clay in a different color. And I'll maybe use stains, maybe use oxides, but do a, an interesting clay that I do a month's worth of and then not used again for you know, a period of time. So each month I'd do a limited edition clay. I have not done that because I don't want to have to clean the pug mill out. If I was doing more at a time, it might be worth doing. Maybe I'll consider switching clay for six months at a time or something like that. But certainly I'm not doing it every month because that's just an additional amount of work that I don't particularly want. So should you buy one? This is going to be a very personal answer to you based on I'll run you through my idea of the criteria that would make this a sensible purchase or not ultimately each one of these factors is kind of individual so it might make sense for you it might not make sense for you the first thing to consider is how much clay do you use you're essentially dividing the cost of the pug mill over the clay that it will process in its lifetime and you can picture that cost as essentially like someone walking into your studio and saying I'll wedge this pile of clay for you for some amount of money and would you pay them to do it if you use tons of clay a year then that's basically someone coming in and offering to wedge the clay for a couple of pennies per kilo that's clearly <laughs> clearly worth it I would happily pay someone pennies to wedge my clay for me but if you don't really throw much clay at all, if say you're a hobby potter or a part-time potter who works alone in a small studio and like you're only throwing maybe a few bags a year, it would be like someone coming in and charging you 30 pounds per kilo of clay to wedge it. Now you have to really want to avoid wedging for that to seem like a good deal, but for some people that might be worth it. So I use the examples and you can see the logic here and then change the numbers to suit you. But say you bought the £6,000 pug mill that I did, you aim to get 30 years constant use out of it, which is £200 a year. 
and again you can kind of picture that as would you rent one for 200 pounds a year that doesn't seem unreasonable if we had two hypothetical studios the first one being a communal studio and you've got dozens of people using it beginner classes so there's going to be a lot of reclaim they could quite realistically be putting through tons of clay a month in kind of prep and then dealing with the aftermath of student classes if you say 1.7 tons a month that's 20 tons a year that works out at one penny per kilo of wedging the alternative hypothetical studio as a single potter in a small studio if you were using 17 kilos a month that is 200 kilos of clay a year and that would be a cost of one pound per kilo to wedge that cost is just for the clay preparation not the clay itself obviously that is like someone was in the studio with you and offered to do your wedging how much would you pay them per kilo if the amount of clay you use a year means that you would end up with a number that you wouldn't pay that person to wedge it so say you were the potter that used 200 kilos a, month, a year and you didn't think that you'd pay someone a pound a kilo to wedge it for you it doesn't make sense to get a pug mill interestingly if you're in that second category and only using a couple of hundred kilos of clay a year so paying pound a kilo equivalent for the, the pug mill usage it would mean that it's quite possible that the pug mill would cost more than all of the clay that it would process in its lifetime because the cheaper clays in the UK are around two-thirds that cost. They're about 60, 70p per kilo. If you added up all of the clay that would go through that pug mill, it would actually cost less than the pug mill itself, over 30 years of constant use. Now, obviously, that is a kind of meaningless comparison because you're, one's a resource and the other one is a labour cost, basically paying to avoid doing the work yourself. But it just kind of puts into perspective how much of an expense these are 30 years of clay could cost less than the machine itself next thing to consider is how many different types of clay do you use as mentioned if you're using more than one clay the pug mill value drops off dramatically because you go from having to clean it very infrequently and it not being a big deal when you do to having to make sure you get all the clay out and having to clean it more frequently so if you've got multiple clays especially if you've got more than like if you've got two clays and you don't vary them that much maybe that's tolerable to you but if you've got a bunch of different clays and you switch between them all the time that is a big downside to the pug mill and might well put you off and then the next one is how much do you mind wedging by hand there are a few different factors that go into this are you experiencing any pain because of physical limitations or injuries etc or do you feel like it's damaging your body are you getting wear and tear from all the physical aspects of pottery how much wedging do you need to do you know you can extrapolate that over your career how good at wedging are you if you're not very good at it and you find it to be a difficult time consuming process then that will factor in but if you're really efficient and it's not really something that you've even considered being a downside then you know you probably don't need a pug mill and then how well prepared is your clay before wedging if it comes out of a bag exactly how you want it that factors in differently to you not being happy with it and wanting to prepare it better all of these affect how much value you'll get out of the pug mill so you have to think about whether or not any of these factors that you're indifferent to them or you know is that a big selling point for a pug mill because the pug mill costs what it costs, but the amount of value you personally will get out of it is affected by those factors. Do you reclaim your clay? If not, you should. I mean, if you're not reclaiming your clay, then at the very least, you should be gathering all the scraps of everything, and then you can give it away to someone else for free to do the reclaim for you. I'm sure there are plenty of people nearby who would love to have free clay. If you are reclaiming your clay, then a pug mill will help with that. And then depending on the mixture of fresh clay to reclaim you're doing, like if you've got a lot of dry reclaim, maybe then you want a mix of pug mill rather than a continuous one. That's something you'll have to think about which one works best for you. Obviously the continuous is better for feeding lots of plastic clay in too because it works continuously, uh, especially if you're having a de-airing one, whereas a mixer one is much better if you're using the reclaim you can skip multiple steps of the reclaim put the dry and wet in and let it do the mixing that would also affect which type of pug mill 
you'd want to get. But overall, it makes sense to invest in a pug mill if any or all of these apply. You process a lot of clay. You would prefer not to wedge by hand. You don't use many different clay bodies. Your studio is big enough to accommodate it. You can afford it without sacrificing the purchase of a more versatile piece of equipment. And or you have a physical issue which makes wedging harder or means you need to adjust the consistency of your purchase clay to be easier to work. If those apply, you might consider a pug mill to be worth the, the cost. It wouldn't make sense to purchase a pug mill if many of the following apply, which are you don't use much clay, you have no issue wedging by hand, you use multiple clay bodies regularly, you have a small studio with no spare space, there are other important pieces of equipment you need to purchase first, and you are happy with the typical consistency of the clay you buy. Depending on which of those two lists applies to you more, it may or may not make sense to buy a pug mill. I definitely don't think they're an essential purchase or possibly even a sensible purchase for most potters working on their own. They are a huge investment. That investment ideally would need to be repaid one way or another. So if it's worth it to you, then it's worth it to you. If it's not worth it to you and you just want one, it might not be a sensible decision. If I could go back before I bought mine, would I still buy it? That is actually a quite a tough question. I think I would, but the decision is actually closer than I thought it was when I bought mine. I thought there would be more upsides to it and fewer downsides. The only thing really putting me off at the time was the cost and the downsides have been more limiting than I expected. And while it is great at what it does, the fact that it I can't switch clays as easily is quite a big argument against it. So yeah, I would buy one. I think it's taking a long view to buy one because it's, it's going to prove its worth over a very long time period. You're not going to get your money's worth out of it in a year, probably, unless you run a studio with a lot of clay to process. Most people would be looking at decades before it fully justified its cost. But if you're thinking of getting one and you think you might get one in five years time, you should get one now because if you're going to be doing this a long time, if you think in a few years you'll have done enough damage to your body from all the physical aspects of pottery that you're doing now that you'll need to buy a pug mill. And I know that applies to at least a few potters who have done all the physical parts for years, if not decades, and then bought a pug mill. If you think that applies to you in the future, buy one now. Because they're, they're not going to wear out. The longer time period you use it over, the more it justifies its cost, the, the, kind of the cheaper its cost per use. And obviously you won't have done the damage to your body that would, that meant that you had to buy one anyway. So if you're going to buy one at any point in your career, buy it as soon as you possibly can justify it. And that means buy all the other equipment that you need first. But once you've got to the point that you've got a perfectly good wheel, you've got a perfectly good kiln, you don't need any other things for the studio to work efficiently, save up and get a pug mill. But if you think that you will never need one, and you're on the fence about it, it probably isn't worth it, do you? So I think that's all I have to say about pug mills. It was a lot more than I expected to say about pug mills. There was more to consider than I initially thought, even after I bought mine. Hopefully this has been useful and I've answered any questions you had. It's quite possible I've missed some. So obviously leave a question in the comments, I'll answer if I can. I'm not a foremost expert on them by any means. So if it's a technical question about one that I've never used, I will just tell you that I have no idea. Hopefully there will be some other people in the comments who might be able to help you. But yeah, let me know if there's anything that I missed, anything else you want to know. I can do a follow-up video or I can just address it in the comments if I can. And see you on the next video.